history in the art of storytelling converge in the work of our three extraordinary authors uh, here with us this morning. They mine archives, at times finding mere fragments, and search out the past in contemporary landscapes as they recover lives and craft their stories. Their books connect us to worlds long gone while helping us to see the times we live in with greater depth and clarity. This morning, we have a chance to learn about and talk with them about their approach to the work of history and their thoughts on how it informs our lives today. I will provide a very brief introduction of each of our panelists and urge you to consult the Martha's Vineyard Book Festival website for more detailed information about them and about their, their books. Jill Lepore teaches history at Harvard University and is a staff writer for The New Yorker. She's the author most recently of The Mansion of Happiness, A History of Life and Death. Her biography of Benjamin Franklin's sister, Book of Ages, The Life and Opinion of Jane Franklin, will be published in October. Tony Horowitz, um, author of many books, most recently of Midnight Rising, John Brown, and the raid that sparked the Civil War. Tony is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who has worked for the Wall Street Journal and written for the New Yorker. Finally, Tom uh, Rees is the author of The Orientalist and uh, won the 20, 2013 Pulitzer Prize for his most recent book, The Black Count, Glory, Revolution, Betrayal, and the Real Count of Monte Cristo. As a journalist, Tom has written for the New Yorker, the Wall Street Journal, and the New York Times. So how we will proceed. Uh, we will begin with brief remarks and some discussion among uh, the authors regarding the topic of this panel. And then we will conclude uh, with questions um, from you all. So starting out on the panel topic, uh, why does history matter? Or put another way, um, how did you come to write about history that blends past and present? You can each speak briefly to that. You, you decide who goes first. OK. <laughs> That's your job. OK. Well, Jill. Oh, OK. <coughs> I think I got to go first because I'm the least prepared. <laughs> um, uh, so obviously, I very deeply believe that history matters a great deal. Um, I think one way, one avenue to explain how history matters is to try to connect the past and the present, but that's not the only way that we can justify the study of the past. In fact, it's actually the way that academic historians feel most strongly that we should not justify the study of the past, which makes it very tricky for me sometimes <laughs> to do what I do. Um, historians really are, are sort of taught that the, a great historical fallacy is to, is to think about the past in relationship to the present, that that introduces all kinds of analytical errors, that if we look to the past, in order to understand how we got here, that we will only really either be doing so in order to kind of critique existing arrangements or to justify them. So, um, and if you think about tyrannical regimes or fascist regimes, for instance, they always invent a history that justifies their rise to power. Um, that's why a court historian is always the worst thing to have in any court, because the court historian can justify any particular grab for power that the court itself wants to make. Right? So there's a, kind of a long and complicated history of why historians are not supposed to talk about the relationship between the past and the present. And academic historians talk about a kind of purity of purpose where we really only look at the past for its own sake. So while I think that's a really interesting kind of argument to make and it's really important to think about when teaching people how to study the past for good reason, um, it also leaves the past, past sort of detached and free floating and that's its own fallacy because of course the past does tell us how we got here and there are answers to be found in the past. And um, so how I came to do what I do, I guess actually a huge thing for me was reading Tony Horowitz's Confederates in the Attic and teaching that book. So incredibly brilliant, dazzling book of reporting and storytelling and archival work all together, sort of asking how we understand the Civil War um, by going around and talking to people who still really care about the Civil War and trying to understand why they care about it and what it means to them in their, in their lives in the present. Um, it was actually the experience of teaching that book, Confederates in the Attic, that made me really, sort of converted me to the idea that it was absolutely crucial that students gain a set of tools by which to understand the relationship between the past and the present. And that, uh, and that one kind of bridge is, 
is the very dedicated and cautious reporter. And uh, I, I think that's, that's one of the things that I've tried to do in the writing that I've done since then is think about with what kind of obligations both to people who lived in the past and to people who live in the present can we tell the truth. Tony, that's a wonderful lead in. <laughs> Keep going. I like that. Uh, what do I owe you for that? We'll talk after. Um, well, since you answered so well the question why history matters or not, um, I'll, I'll skip that one and just a little bit about how I personally came to sort of blend past and present. Um, in my case, it was really uh, an accident. Um, I was a history nerd from early childhood used to line up uh, little plastic presidents by my bed in order before I went to sleep. Uh, you know, my siblings uh, thought I was strange, uh, which I probably was. Uh, I went on to study history in college and thought I wanted to perhaps teach history for a living, um, but got waylaid um, in the present for about 15 years. Um, as a reporter, uh, mainly a foreign correspondent, uh, writing the news uh, rather than what happened uh, long ago. Um, and I loved uh, my time as a reporter, but one frustration was that whenever I tried to sneak a few paragraphs of historical context into whatever I was writing about, that would invariably be the first thing that editors cut, you know. It's the news business. Um, and they're just, uh, I would say, journalism generally is not very good at that, uh, that part of the story. Um, so I uh, came back to the US after a long time away and wanted to find a way to get back to history. Uh, but my problem was I hadn't, uh, gone on to get a PhD in history, and really the only thing I knew how to do was uh, kind of parachute into strange places and improvise once I got there. That's pretty much what you do as a foreign correspondent, at least in the Middle East where I was. So uh, without really thinking about it, I began applying that MO <laughs> to history of just reporting history in the present, uh, taking the Civil War and Confederates in the attic and saying, well, where are the places one could go and the memory keepers one could talk to to see how the Civil War is still uh, with us today uh, and how history is still with us. Um, and I don't even know what to call it. It's a sort of hybrid of history, journalism, and travel. And I went on to do more books in that vein. Um, and I think um, there's no great philosophy behind it. It just feels to me the right way to approach history, and uh, one that I feel I have the tools to do as a journalist uh, by training, um, really looking at how uh, the past bleeds into the present and how the present bleeds into our understanding of the past. And I think uh, one advantage of this that maybe we can talk about later is that it makes history something, it's not a sort of remote object of study, it's here with us today, and I, um, you know, suits me, that's all I can say. Um, well, first, I'm, I'm just deeply honored to be on the panel with two writers I admire so much, and uh, I definitely, it's interesting to hear Jill Lepore's comments, which I find so interesting. I was once, briefly a history major at Harvard, and I was actually bored stiff. So um, I didn't have any professors, I guess. You didn't take any of my classes. I did not take any of your classes. And so I was, and, and I'd say luckily so, because if I had, um, I might not have. Uh, You'd have been doomed to become a historian. Yeah, I would have been doomed to become a historian, which maybe would have been a good thing, but I wouldn't be able to maybe do the things that, I, the kind of books that I write. And when I think um, to add something to the comments that uh, already speak for some of what I think, the kind of books that I write, well, for one thing, to play on Tony's point about the news, I guess my approach to history is to try to make it every bit as uh, sort of unexpected as reading the day's news. I feel like the sort of fallacy people have, I mean, especially Americans in, in our country where we uh, have this horrible expression, it's history, and uh, that kind of means that it's not worth talking about. Um, 
which since I do a lot of my work in Europe, the attitude is very different, and in uh, other countries, um, the attitude towards history. Here in the United States, as Tocqueville and other people uh, had noticed since the beginning of our republic, is that Americans always want to look forward, and so history is disparaged. But to me, the, ge the general problem with that is that we don't actually know what happened in history, really any more than we know what's happening today in the Middle East. History to me is, it's like going back, trying to go back in time, and I'm always, when I do, I always find something completely shocking to me. And I guess my um, distinct method, which I just realized, uh, sort of waiting to make these remarks, is that somehow, I've always gotten into history through its intersection with fiction. So I write biographies, and it so happens that the last two ones that I've written, The Orientalist and now The Black Count, are both about characters who, in one case, uh, it was about a, a man who, a Jewish man who uh, escapes the Russian Revolution on a camel caravan and then reinvents himself as a Muslim prince in Europe uh, in the 1920s and then becomes the best-selling writer, a best-selling writer in Nazi Germany while using two literary surnames and who eventually reinvents his own identity so many times that he goes almost, you could say, aside from the fact that no one else in the world knows who he is anymore, he almost doesn't know who he is himself. and so. It's, it's about, in that case, a man who turned himself into a fictional character, which gave me an entirely new perspective on the era that he lived in, on the Nazi years and on the Russian Revolution. And in my current book, I'm researching a man whose life, while it was very well known during the French Revolution, he was a rival of Napoleon and all kinds of other important things happened to him, was erased from history and then recreated by his son, the novelist Alexander Dumas, as a fictional character, or as a number of fictional characters. So I guess that's really the, and when I think about how I got into all of this, back when I was bored in history class, which started much before college, I used to sit there and in, imagine myself at the Alamo or wherever, and then I actually created an alter ego, a fictional character that I would write in those places, and that was my equivalent of uh, not paying attention in class. So. <laughs> Um, anyway, that's, that's how I got into it. Okay. Well, um, each of you, you know, beyond archival research, um, you all travel a lot uh, to research your topics. And so um, what value is this on the ground research when landscapes have changed so much from the times of your subjects' lives? Could you talk a little bit about that? Oh, sorry. If you want to stall. Oh, no, okay. I'm sorry. Here I am again. <laughs> oh, least whoever. Um, I think I just travel the least is the thing. It's, um, I have three children and a full-time teaching schedule. I almost never travel, and it's a huge problem, actually. Okay. Um, I think one of the things I love about archival work is the way it can sort of take you mm -hmm. away. I think the the imaginative work of traveling through an alter, fictional alter ego, or whatever it is about the people you're writing about that takes you into their world is, it's that same piece of you that mm -hmm. falls in love with a character when you're reading a novel. And mm -hmm. you can fall in love with people in the archives mm -hmm. just as passionately. Um, I, I, so I guess I would stand by the work of the imagination that okay. doesn't require those footsteps. Um, nevertheless, it is hugely important to, to go there. Um, a thing, I, the, the book that I've written that's coming out in the fall that's about Benjamin Franklin's little sister Jane, which is a book I, I took many years to actually manage to finish writing because I had other things to do. Um, but I used to, for a long time, I would go down uh, to downtown Boston in the North End. If you've ever been, we're like, you know where the, the Paul Revere statue is, that equestrian statue in the North End, it's right behind the Old North Church. So uh, when that statue was put up in 1939, it, was, it started being built in the 1880s. It just took forever. They kind of ran out of money. When they um, finished putting up the statue, they decided that the, the view from the North Church to the statue was a, a somewhat marred by a tiny little brick house. 
um, that made the kind of postcard picture photograph not great because you couldn't see the steep you could see the steeple but you couldn't see the background of the church against the horse so they demolished this house well this was Jane Franklin's house um, and there's now there's a little garden there it's a pathway to get from the statue of Paul Revere to the old North Church these beacons these icons of Boston and the American Revolution and uh, there's at the moment there's a memorial that's a bunch of dog tags the dog tags of men who've died in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's this um, interesting war memorial. Um, Jane happened to have been a pacifist, so maybe there's something beautiful about that memorial. But I, I find it very heartbreaking that in the archives, almost everything about her life has been erased for all kinds of complicated reasons, right down <laughs> to the demolition of her house. And I think a lot about what it would have meant for me as a historian to be able to walk through that house. But so much of the past of the people that I most care about, is mainly people who are illiterate, is actually demolished physically in the archives. It doesn't exist in the archives. So that falling in love with someone in the archives that's so important to me as a, as a writer uh, isn't really possible always for the people that I most deeply, passionately want to write about. And what they've left behind uh, Jane's tombstone was knocked over to make room for this giant monument to, the, to Benjamin Franklin that was put in the old ground. Like everything about her has really been sort of demolished. Um, so it's, a, it's this monster about going to a place you can no longer get to, that really only your imagination can carry you to, um, that it takes a long time to get there and it's not about walking. Didn't you... Uh go to that evil other island, though, to research what was, what was yeah, there? Yeah, you know, her mother was born on uh, Nantucket. Um, but, her, but, but actually, they were here first. They were married here in Martha's Vineyard, the, the Folgers, because uh, Jane's grandfather was the first Indian missionary here. Um, and then they went to Nantucket. And there's a little, a little monument there, sort of this windswept side of the, yeah. side of the road. Um, so no, I mean I do, I do always eventually go. I just, it, it just takes a long time, and I guess I, it's it's not the same as going to Gettysburg, right? Like where the where, where the landscape has been effectively turned into a monument yeah. to the past. That has its own problems, right? Like yeah. that's actually not a way of going to a place. This actually tells you more about the memory of the thing yeah. than the thing itself. Like it actually it interferes, I think, in Gettysburg. Actually, and maybe you guys, I don't know. Because maybe it's like a guy thing with the president yeah. guy. <laughs> Uh, well, I'll, I'll differ in a sense just because I have the luxury to do so. I don't have to um, teach or grade papers or go to departmental meetings, which is a, a great You mean you blessing. don't get to go to departmental meetings? Yeah, right. <laughs> I know every, every professor I've ever met says that's the best thing about being yeah. a professor. Um, so I do have the luxury to um, uh, go to the places where the history happened. Um, and I found it hugely valuable um, in all kinds of ways. Sometimes it's just you've been thinking a lot about something in the archives or elsewhere, and then you see it. You realize, oh, yeah, I mean, uh, my most recent book is about John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. And one of the many debates is whether this scheme could ever have worked. Well, in my view, you spend five minutes in Harper's Ferry, which is the bottom of a river gorge, and you see this was an absolute shooting gallery, that this was the most exposed, that once in, you were trapped, and that, uh, to me, it helped um, confirm views I was already developing about how realistic this plan was and what was he up to. But I also think it, um, for me, it's most valuable when I sit down to write. Um, um, another Harper's Ferry example, the raid begins with a march from Brown and his men have a hideout at a log house in the mountains of Maryland and they march down in the middle of the night to Harper's Ferry to seize the armory there. And on the 150th anniversary of that march, I went with some other pilgrims uh, at the exact hour along the exact route they marched and luckily the, the log hideout still exists, the countryside hasn't changed that much. Um, and for me, the experience, and there's very little documentary evidence on this march because most of the participants die soon after. Um, but uh, we had a horse-drawn wagon, as Brown and his men did. We didn't go any further than that. Um, but something about the looming mountains in the dark and the steam rising from the horses' flanks 
and the sound of the Potomac as we approached it and the lights of Harper's Ferry uh, across the uh, river. When I got back to my, you know, sort of flea pit motel in, in um, uh, Harper's Ferry uh, at midnight, I sat down and just banged out sort of 10 pages um, uh, about that march, combining what I knew of it from the documents with my experience. Um, and that ended up being the beginning of my book. So I think also being in these places can kind of put you in the right frame of mind mm -hmm. to reimagine. Because yeah, in this case, I was doing an act of historical imagination. But I think being there really helped me do that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to take a bit of both those answers from my colleagues, because they obviously uh, affect me too. But I don't really, I'm not a great believer in, for me, in going places to sort of walk the walk. Um, although it's a bit strange, because I think I was, I was trying to count up from these last two books that I've done, The Orientalist and the Black Count, I think I've, I went to something in the ballpark of 17 or 18 different countries to get the stuff, but that's actually the operative word for me. I'm going out to get the stuff. And I love what um, Jill said about archives, but since for me, I'm writing about people who have been in some way almost deliberately erased from history or have erased themselves. And so in, I don't, there are no archives to my, my guys. My guys, I am essentially, I'm, the, I'm their first archivist. In the case of General Dumas, the, my current character, Alexander Dumas, there's huge materials that I found in the French war archives from the 1790s because he was a great war hero. As I shorthand him, he's kind of like the Audie Murphy of the French Revolution. Um, he was this insanely decorated uh, swordsman. Um, who then rose actually to the rank of four-star general, which by the way, as an African-American, makes him the highest ranking African-American officer um, in a Western army before Colin Powell. But, so there's a lot written about him then, but actually all of the real personal, the real information I needed to write his story now, that was not held in archives because he became an enemy of the state and the state didn't want to keep an archive on him. There wasn't even a statue remaining to him in, in France. There isn't. There, there was briefly a statue, but uh, it got torn down by the Nazis when they invaded Paris because they had a list of Negroid statues that they had to tear down, if you can believe that. And the statue of Alexander, General Alexander Dumas, he is very much, uh, a black man. There's no way you, he didn't want to disguise it. And in fact, a lot of the point of my book is that during the French Revolution, the French government was proud of that fact. They later became ashamed of it, which shows me also another thing. I'm fascinated by how history doesn't march in one direction, right? The world can go down as well as it can go up. And I found that at the end of the French, at the end of the 18th century, on matters of race, and uh, acceptance and uh, equality. The French Republic had done things that no other major government would do really for more than 100 years, but then France went steadily backwards on all those things. But anyway, as I say, I go basically to get the goods, and in the case of, um, say, General Dumas, who I've been talking about, I definitely did this walk the walk thing. I went to the town. Um, uh, where he had died in 1806. At the beginning of my intense research for this book, when I was still not sure, as I'm sure all of us, we all have this problem if um, a lot of the stuff to Jane Addams has been destroyed. Am I really sure this book's gonna work? Well, probably it's gonna work, because I'm fascinated, but you know, what's gonna be there? So I'm fascinated my whole life, really, with this forgotten character, the father of Alexander Dumas, but really, what am I gonna find except stuff about him you know, winning sword fights and things like that, or, or battles. I mean, how am I gonna find the personal stuff? I went to the town where he died. Basically, I hung around, I schmoozed with people, and um, uh, to, without going on, I, I found, I made a connection with a lady who had been collecting documents on the Alexander Dumas family. And, uh, well, 
this also became the incident at the beginning of my book because by the time we had worked out the arrangements and I went to see the documents, this woman had suddenly dropped dead. She had suddenly died and had left all her documents in a locked safe. And she, being rather eccentric, as many of the people that it seems like I depend on for my stories are, <laughs> are often rather eccentric, um, uh, she had not told anyone um, the combination to this safe. Um, it was in the office uh, of a government building where she worked. And um, uh, so I found myself um, needing to figure out how to get into the safe, which actually became a sort of Alexandre Dumas or Balzac sort of story of getting to know this town government in France and convincing them to allow an American historical researcher, a man with a passion as we all have for history and for their history and for France, and I've got a lot of personal reasons to please go into your office and let me bring in somebody to blow up this safe. <laughs> and uh, that's why you got to go there. You can't blow up a safe on the internet, you know? And uh, um, that's how, how I wrote The Black Count. I mean, I couldn't have done it without that. Anyway, thanks. <laughs> Yes, I was just going to add something about the um, no one's going to top the safe story. Let's just get that. That's <laughs> we're done. Um, but with regard to the, the the need to walk the walk, I mean, I think there's a, there actually is a, a, a peril there. There's a real danger in subscribing to some of the logic of, for instance, the heritage tourism movement. That the idea that we the reason we care about the past is that if we could just go there and dress up and stand in that place we would be like them. We would know what it felt like to be on the Mayflower, to be in Plymouth Plantation, to, to fight in the Battle of Gettysburg. I think that's a profoundly reactionary political position to hold. Um, I did a long uh, piece for The New Yorker years ago, and then I ended up writing a book about the Tea Party movement, mm -hmm. where I spent a lot of time um, having wonderful conversations with people who very passionately uh, held a set of political views that they felt were um, entirely undergirded by collapsing the distance between the present and the past. That, mm -hmm. I mean, I would stand on the street, I would stand beneath this Paul Revere equestrian statue with people who would say, we are Paul Revere. We are here defending the liberty of American citizens against Obamacare because we exist fighting the same struggle that Paul Revere fought mm -hmm. in 1775. And in the, that's, that piece of their logic comes from the desire, a very genuine and, and um, sincere and laudable desire to, uh, to, to have common cause with people of other times and places. And there's something deeply humane about that. Mm -hmm. um, but to just go fishing in the past for political justification mm -hmm. for your own position, no matter what, where you are on the political spectrum, is a really tricky thing. That's sort of where I was sort of in, in my introductory remarks about the problem mm -hmm. of approaching the past for the sake of the present, um, the instrumental use of the past for the sake of the present. Uh, that, that's really troubling. And is actually, uh, we have a lot of turning away from history, as, as Tom and, and um, Tony, we're both suggesting that's actually a big part of our sort of like forward march of history. We were Americans, it's always the future's overhead. But, but actually to the degree that we look to the past, it's almost always in a, in a, in a very conservative mm -hmm. political cast, which is, which is quite interesting and deeply unlike other countries. I mean, you can sort of see how France's history evolves in this interesting way. Um, but that it's, there's nothing inherent about uh, interest in the past that would be necessarily conservative, but it happens to have that uh, cast in the United States. Well, very briefly, because we want to move to, to Q&A, but, but sort of the flip side of that is, you know, we're drawn as historians to certain subjects by contemporary, I mean, not in that way, to prove a certain point or, or a certain position, but through your writing, I mean, you're all sort of biographers, you, know, you recover these lives. How do um, the people you've written about, how do you think they help us to think about some of the issues in our current historical moment? How does the past help shine a light on our present versus looking to the past to justify uh, the present. Any, any brief thoughts about that? And we can move into to Q&A. Uh, sure, I'll jump in. I mean, I, I share uh, Jill's caution about yeah. uh, mm -hmm. trying to collapse that distance. But I think it's impossible with any of these subjects mm -hmm. not uh, you know, you're writing your book, you're in the archives, but, you know, in my case, mm -hmm. if you're a news junkie, you're also paying attention to what's mm -hmm. going on in the world, and I think it's really impossible not to be influenced by that and think about it. Um, 
Uh, in my case, when I heard it, I mean, uh, most recently writing about John Brown, mm -hmm. sure, there are all kinds of resonances right. today in terms of uh, uh, terrorism, when do individuals, if ever, have the right to defy their government, um, race, you know, all these issues that resonate. But I noticed it more in an earlier book I did, uh, A Voyage Long and Strange, where I was uh, writing about early exploration of America, uh, much of which was Spanish. And so, and this happened to be at a moment about five years ago when the immigration debate was particularly heated. And there I was driving through the Southwest on the path of uh, Spanish settlers who had gotten here a hundred years before the first English arrived, listening to talk radio hosts and politicians ranting about, you know, these Hispanic newcomers who were invading and undermining yeah. our Anglo culture. And also hearing resonances of a lot of the um, uh, very xenophobic and sometimes quite racist language that was used in the 19th century to justify manifest destiny, that Hispanic culture was lazy and indolent and, uh, you know, all, all the kinds of things we hear again today. So I guess it helped me realize there really uh, is a history to everything that's going on uh, in our own time, often in ways that most Americans don't even recognize. Well, I don't want to take up time from the q and I think those were both really um, things that resonate with me. I mean, in the case of my first book, The, the Orientalist, I spent a whole lot of time in the Caucasus, in, in Azerbaijan particularly, and uh, that's another place where they use history to justify, you know, kind of ridiculous things that the current regime wants to, to do. And in fact, my, that, that book that I wrote, The Orientalist, has been, uh, you know, it's been published in like 20 something countries and people like it in a lot of countries. The one place that they don't like it is in Azerbaijan where you'd think they'd sell it in every gift shop because probably every second tourist or every, only every tourist who goes there uh, is going there probably because they read my book because there were very little else in English about it. Um, so they should like it, but what they don't like is I interrupted their historical narrative because I took the guy who is considered sort of the modern Shakespeare of Azerbaijan, this fellow who had written a, uh, a book um, under the name Kurban Said, this novel um, that they, it's their Romeo and Juliet story, and I showed the world that his real name was Leo Nussenbaum. And, uh, <laughs> okay, and look, they're a liberal Muslim country. They should be able to deal with that. They're not particular, people are not, are pretty open-minded, but it just broke their national narrative. They did not like that too much. And uh, yeah, I think that, uh, look, that's our job to do stuff like that. And uh, in this, in, the, in my current book, I'm, I've been happy to find out that, uh, um, you know, uh, a lot of racial integration that we think of as something that happened first in the late 20th century actually uh, was tried and was working in the um, late 18th century and a particular resonance um, that isn't directly connected to my story but very much uh, I think about a lot is I never really understood why Haiti got so marginalized and um, you know this I, the, the history of Haiti I think is quite mysterious even to people who still study it and read a lot of books about it. Well, one small piece that my story was able to add, I'm not sure has hardly ever been or maybe not written about really, is that Toussaint Louverture, his sons were students at an elite integrated mixed race school in France, as were the children of other members of the Haitian elite. It wasn't even called Haitian elite at the time. They considered themselves part of the global French Republic. They were elite French citizens of color who were sending their kids to be educated at this great biracial experiment in Paris. Well, you know what happened when Napoleon had his coup d'etat? He closed that school. He threw those kids out into the street. Um, some of them died or were beaten to death. Toussaint's sons actually uh, were sent back tragically to Haiti. But if if I had to find one more personal cause for why the Haitian uprising became so bloody and uh, why that uh, horrible history began, look, that little footnote of history, nobody ever writes about those kids, but I bet the first leaders of Haiti, mm -hmm. that was a lot on their minds when they were um, breaking with France. Anyway. Great, thank you. Okay, well, um, we have some time for questions. And um, is there a microphone or 
to go uh, over here? Okay. Um, so we just ask you that your questions be brief since our time is short and that um, you direct them to a specific author or to the panel as you see fit. Good, good morning, I'll jump on the mic. Uh, Tony and Tom, to both of you, first of all, thank you so much. I've read both of your books and they've been profoundly impactful to me. My question is, um, we all understand, I think, in this room, how amazing it is to find a novel that's embracing and creates an experience that you often can't find any other way through any other media. Uh, specifically, Tom, uh, Django Unchained was what brought me to the Black Count. Oh. And I want to ask about that relationship between other sources of media and popular culture and bringing young people to uh, the joy of reading. Um, have you thought much about that? Uh, was the connection with Django planned? Um, will you exploit the idea that we're spending all our time in a digital world and, you know, seeding the digital world with the joy of reading and encouraging people to go to novels. Is that part of your strategy as authors? Thank you. <laughs> well, Jill has written a novel, so I think you should, come on, jump in there. What was that like in? Writing a, a novel? Well, as a historian. And, Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's a great blind spot. Um, great I'll book. tell a story that is somewhat somewhat relevant to the to the maybe to the Django part of the question here. A um, number of years ago, I wrote a book about a slave rebellion in New York City in 1741. The book's called New York Burning. And for that, you couldn't go to the 18th century New York. 18th century Lower Manhattan doesn't exist. If you've been to Lower Manhattan recently, it's really hard to see. Unlike Boston or you know Martha's Vineyard, where you can imagine what this place looked like a long time ago. Um, so I reconstructed the entire city using GIS data, using tax databases and census data, and I, I did this whole reconstruction of the city. Mm -hmm. And then I got to the pivotal scene of my story that I was telling as a historian, which was uh, 13 black men were burned at the stake in New York and, and 17 more were hanged. They were, cons they were accused of conspiring to burn New York City down. And I wanted to describe the executions and uh, these burning of the black men at the stake, and I, I just felt like, I did not have enough evidence to describe these executions. And in particular, I wanted to talk about this one guy named Caesar who was confined in this dungeon in the basement of City Hall in New York. And because uh, he was the only literate guy that I could find. And he, all I found about him was that he read the Bible and he cried while he was in this dungeon. He, Caesar read much, read little and cried much. I had, like these four words or whatever. And so um, I realized I just didn't feel like, as a historian, I had the authority to talk about what Caesar's experience was like. So I wrote a novel in which the same scene takes place. <laughs> and I thought, this would be great. Like I sat down, I was so excited to write the chapter where I, my, my character was going to witness the execution of this guy. And I got to the scene and I realized, even as a novelist, I didn't feel like I had the authority actually uh, to know what it was to be that 18th century guy, born in Ghana, raised in the Caribbean, ending up in Boston, being burned at the stake. Um, and so I think that uh, my answer to your question is <laughs> I do think that both that there's a great deal of affinity between the storytelling power of history and of novels, but I also think there's a great deal that's required of readers of both genres in using their own imagination to think about the limits of our knowledge of other human beings in different times and places. And actually, this is just to sort of underscore my the past is a long way away. It's not very close. We do not actually, we can't bridge that distance very, very easily. Um, well, just the, the, they were, the, the scene in Django Unchained that he was referring to is that uh, towards the end where the bloody gunfight breaks out, and it breaks out because over the line um, uh, where the one character says to the other, you knew that Alexander Dumas is black, right? And uh, it's, he's saying it to the very racist guy who, uh, this horrible plantation owner who loves Alexander Dumas, who obviously doesn't know he's black. Um, and um, all I'll say is I definitely didn't get any ideas from Django Unchained because um, I'd finished my book by then. But I have to say, Jamie Foxx is one of the few people who had an advanced copy a while ago. So it's possible they knew about it. From, they knew they, they got that line from there. But I'm happy they did. So. Thank you.
Each of you in your own way, especially Tony in Voyage Long and Strange, seem to be working at getting it right. Jane Franklin was neglected, all these people before the Pilgrims, your two characters. In your work at getting it right, is it for personal satisfaction? Do you somehow feel you're honoring those people? Do you actually hope to change the dialogue by getting it right? Um, I don't know. What's the alternative? Not getting it right? I, I, uh, uh, I do feel, and you know, partly, um, I think in this sense, journalism and, and history as disciplines are similar. Uh, you're, you want to get at the truth as best you can. Um, you're judging what are reliable sources and unreliable sources. You're, you're bringing some of the same tools and I think there's that same commitment to trying to get the fa establish the facts as uh, best one can. So, I mean, I don't know if it's personal satisfaction because actually it can be a pain in the neck, you know, trying to fact check and fact check again every little thing to make sure you want it right. I think more than anything in my own case, maybe because I'm not a, a historian by training, so I'm. I'm the last thing I want is to make a mistake because there's nothing that undermines your credibility, I think, more quickly. I know it as a newspaper reader, but, um, uh, or if I'm reading a history book where I thought, gee, I just know that to be wrong. Why should I trust what this author is saying in other regards? And so, I don't know. I just think it's pretty fundamental to the exercise to, to, to get the facts right. But. Yeah, I think, I mean, it is, there is a piece of it that feels like honoring the dead, but yeah. I, um, you know, you, you, you just, I was asked if I wanted, someone I wanted to write about who was alive a few years ago for the first time, and I, and I thought, oh, I only really, I prefer to write about dead people. <laughs> and, well, partly they don't talk back, but also I'm just more comfortable with that. <laughs> and then, so I thought, well, I'll write about someone who's nearly dead. And <laughs> Freshly dead. Ooh. Oh, nearly dead. That's, nearly that's dead. kind of nearly dead. So, um, so I decided I wanted to, I wanted to write a profile. Uh, this was a, an article for The New Yorker that's part of this book, Mansion of Happiness. I wanted to write a profile of this guy, Robert Edinger, who freezes the dead. And he was 90 years old at the time. And he'd spent his whole life uh, trying to devise this proper means by which to preserve the dead so that they could be resurrected by scientists in the future when science is ready to reanimate them and rejuvenate them. And I, I, I thought that he was actually a lot like a historian in that way, right? Like he, we, like, or like an archivist, and that he, he, he had frozen uh, like 100 people at, the, at that point and kept them in freezers not far from his house, including his mother and his f first two wives. And, <laughs> and I thought, I really want to meet this guy. And I went out and I met him, and I spent several days with him, and I was completely fascinated by everything about him. And then I came back home and I called Tony and I said, Tony, I can't write about this guy. He's not dead yet. <laughs> like I was actually, like the distance between being a journalist and being a historian really overwhelmed me. I thought like, how did journalists do it? Like I, I, I it was really kind of introduced a different set of ethical questions for me because you want to, as a historian, you, want, you don't want to make any mistake. Like it's really, people make mistakes all the time. There's just a lot of crappy history out there, as you, as you well know. Oh, yeah. So it's just an enormous amount of crap. So, which is just full of errors that are just m casual, like as if no one cared. And like you care a lot about the baby. So, um, but you care differently as a, as, as a journalist. Um, and that was really, it took, me a long, it took me a long time to figure out how to, how to write about that guy. Uh, partly because he had said he wanted to kill himself. And, um, this uh, uh, already, I, you can see, you're just like, oh, <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> it was a very complicated thing, but it taught me a lot about what our obligations are both to the living and to the dead as writers. That is a wonderful note to oh. end on because we're out of time. But the good news is each of our authors will be speaking tomorrow at Chilmark. And please join us outside for a book yeah, signing. You can Thank talk you. to us out there. Yeah, yeah. That's great.